Hello, I'm Ronald Melki from France, and I will be giving a talk about the molecular basis of Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy. Uh, I have nothing to disclose and no conflict of interest. As you all know, Parkinson's disease and multiple system atrophy are sporadic age related disorders. Parkinson's disease is a slow progressing disease while multiple system atrophy progresses fast. In both cases, uh, we observe in the brain the formation of clumps, which are called Levy bodies or Levy neurite. But in the case of MSA, and specifically the case of MSA, we have in addition cytoplasmic inclusion in oligodendrocytes. These clumps or protein inclusion are rich in a small protein. The name of the protein is alpha synuclein. And this protein is therefore a sort of hallmark of these diseases. We have evidences that alpha synuclein deposits propagate in the brain of Parkinson's disease patients and multiple system atrophy patients. These evidence come from two sets of works and I will present them briefly. So the first uh, evidence is come from a relationship between the distribution of alpha synuclein pathology within the brain over time and disease stages. And this relationship was established by Heiko Bragg and his group. So what we observe in Parkinson's disease uh, the first regions that are affected by this pathology, these clumps of alpha synuclein, are the olfactory bulb and the brain stem. With time, these regions are more and more affected by pathology. And what we observe is a spread of pathology from these regions to other regions within the brain. In multiple system atrophy, as you all know, we have two forms of the disease a form that we call MSAP for MSA with Parkinsonian-like uh, uh, phenotype, and MSAC, which is a form that affects the cerebellum. So in MSAP, the first regions that are affected by pathology are the putamen and the substantia nigra. These regions are more and more affected by pathology, and then again, the pathology spreads to other regions within the brain. In MSAC, the first regions that are affected are the caudate and the cerebellum. These regions are more and more affected with, by pathology over time. And then again, as I said, for other diseases, you have the pathology that spreads or affect other regions within the brain. The second evidence that we have su suggesting that there is propagation came from observation made by Patrick Brundin and Jeff Cordover. What Patrick Brundin and Jeff Cordover observed in the brain of patients suffering from Parkinson's disease who got fetal brain tissue grafts to compensate for the loss of dopaminergic neuron is that the graft 10 to 15 years after being uh, grafted in the brain of patient contain levy bodies. Uh, in usually a brain that is 10 to 15 years old contain, uh, I mean, never contains levy bodies. Uh, so they hypothesized that the graft, uh, that the levy bodies within the graft were, were coming from the affected regions of the brain. In other words, that the levy bodies within the aged brain were propagating or spreading to uh, the young uh, bits of brain that were placed in the brain of these patients. So this led many groups, including mine, to hypothesize that alpha synuclein aggregates can spread and multiply. So my talk will be about how they form I will show you that they do indeed propagate between neuronal cells. I will show you how they bind to the cell, how they are taken up, how they are transported, and I will show you what are the consequences of these events. I will then show you uh, seeding of uh, endogenous alpha synuclein 
by these exogenous aggregate and what are the consequences. And I will finish with a part dealing with how different, uh, how alpha synuclein aggregates uh, can cause different diseases. So alpha synuclein is a dynamic protein that adopt multiple conformation in our cells. One of these conformation can interact with molecule in the same conformation to form aggregates. And these aggregates are dynamic. They form and dissociate as shown on this video that I made with Franz Parkinson uh, to explain uh, disease progression. These aggregates are taken in charge by molecular chaperone and are degraded by the proteasome. And there is an equilibrium between the formation of these aggregates and their degradation. With time, these aggregates become longer and longer as represented here. And uh, the molecular chaperone and the proteasome, which are in charge of degrading them, become less efficient. They then accumulate in the cell, clump together to form the Levy bodies I showed you and I presented, introduced earlier. These Levy bodies are deleterious for the neuron. They end up the neuron end up disconnecting from their neighbor and dying eventually. So we are lucky we can assemble alpha synuclein in a test tube into fibrils. And you see these fibril here in the electron microscope. We can label these fibrils with the dye, red for example, and we can add them to neurons that we grow in plates. And you can see here from these images that the neurons, whether they are striatal, cortical, or hippocampal, expressing or not alpha synuclein, bind these fibrils. Uh, other cell types within our brain also bind the fibrils. Uh, the, these are the astrocytes, the microglial cells, but also, and very important for MSA, the oligodendrocytes in green here. So, uh, the neurons, they, the neurons bind these fibrils, they are labeled in red, the neuron membrane are labeled in green here. And uh, we ask the question, what structure of the neuron these fibrils bind to? Uh, as you know, the neurons have dendrites and axons. So we looked at binding, and as you can see from these images, both the neuron, the axons and the dendrites bind uh, the fibrils. Uh, a very important part of the neuron is the synapse. And as you can see from this image, the fibrils bind also to the synapses. So we next ask the question, what protein these fibrils bind to? What are their receptor, in other words? So we expose briefly neurons to fibrils with a tag. We pulled on the tag and we identified the protein that bind to the fibrils by mass spectrometry. And as you can see here, we identified 178 proteins. This is sad because I would have loved to identify one or two receptor. Instead of one or two receptor, we have 178 receptors. And why am I saying that it is sad? Because if we had only one or two receptors, then we could block this receptor and inhibit fibrils binding to the neuron and all the consequences that I will be showing you immediately. The first consequence is uh, the redistribution of important protein at the surface of the neurons. So let's focus on one of these receptors, and this is the sodium potassium ATPase. This protein is a very important protein. It is evenly distributed at the surface of the neuron, it is, and it is in charge of pumping out of the neuron the sodium and establishing a difference of potential between the inside of the neuron and the outside of the neuron. And you may know that difference, this, this difference of potential is essential for the neuronal influx. So this protein is evenly distributed at the surface of the neuron, except when we expose the neuron to aggregated alpha synuclein. 
These aggregates form clumps at the surface of the neuron. And you can see here that the sodium potassium ATPase labeled in green also form clumps then. And these clumps co-localize meaning that the sodium potassium ATPase is redistributed at the surface of the neuron. And at the single cell, uh, at the single molecule level, you can see here a sodium potassium ATPase moving at the surface of the neuron until it hits a cluster of alpha cyanuclein in red. And you can see it sequestered within this cluster. And this has consequences. The pumping activity of the sodium potassium ATPase is lost. And this has very deleterious consequences for the neuron. After binding, the aggregates are taken up and transported by the neuron. To show this, we grew human neuron in special culture dishes. Uh, these culture dishes allows us to uh, orient the neuron so that we have the cell body in one compartment and the axon in the other compartment. When we added the fibrils, alpha cyanuclein fibrils to the cell body, we saw them getting labeled in red, and we saw transport of these aggregates to the axonal part of the neuron. And because we had neurons sitting in this other chamber where we have the uh, axons, we saw uptake of the aggregates by these secondary neurons. And this movie here shows you how they move and they move really very efficiently along the axons within these little microgrooves. When we added the fibrils to the axonal termini, we saw also uptake and transport toward the cell body of the neurons. And in a non-oriented culture, you can see here how fast these aggregates traffic. You can see all these particles moving in all directions. So to, so to sort of illustrate what is going on, I have here a, a scheme. So these aggregates, for example, let's say released from dying cells, are taken up by the cell body of neurons and transported to the axonal end. And this is what we call anterograde transport. Uh, when uh, the aggregates are bound to the axon, they are transported ret retrogradely to the, to the cell body. So we have an active transport mediated by molecular motors that are called dynines and kinesines. And uh, this allows the transport of these aggregates along the microtubule network uh, in one direction or the other. During transport, these aggregates escape from the compartment where they are, reach the cytosol where they amplify. We showed this with a Campbell uh, using neurons that express this protein, galactin-3. This protein binds to sugar at the surface of the cell or in the lumen of endosomes and lysosomes. So in normal cell, it is evenly distributed. In cells exposed to aggregates, alpha synuclein aggregates, this time the aggregates are labeled in green, uh, you see that the protein form clumps, and these clumps co-localize with these clumps of alpha cyanuclein that are in green. So what is happening here is that the aggregates are taken up by endocytosis. They are directed toward the lysosome, where they are supposed to be degraded. A fraction of these aggregates, and we quantified this fraction, it's between 7 and 10 percent, uh, end up escaping from these endosomes and lysosomes. And this is why uh, the galactin-3 binds to them, because when you break open an endosome or lysosome in, in, in a cytosol containing galactin-3, the galactin-3 is going next to, the, to bind to the sugars that are exposed in the lumen of these compartments. This fraction of alpha synuclein fibril that reach the cytosol uh, this time labeled in red, recruit the endogenous alpha synuclein, this time labeled in green, and you can see the formation of clumps, which are very similar to Levy bodies, authentic Levy bodies, and to Levy neurite, authentic Levy neurite, that we observe in the brain of patients. 
in the cells where we had seeding and recruitment of the endogenous alpha cyanoclein, and only in these cells, we observed uh, another event, which is mitochondrial fragmentation and condensation. And this again is deleterious. Mitochondria are our sort of uh, power, the power station of our cells and the lungs of our cells. So to summarize what I showed you so far, uh, uh, we have this slide where I'm sort of restating what I showed you. Uh, so alpha cyanoclein fibrils bind to neuronal cell, uh, to the neuronal cell uh, membrane. They compromise the integrity of this uh, membrane uh, and compromise neuron neuron communication by redistributing uh, uh, important protein at the surface of the cell. Uh, what I showed you also is that alpha cyanoclein aggregates injure the neuronal endolysosomal compartment and reach the cytosol. And I showed you also that they injure and compromise mitochondrial function uh, and integrity when uh, they reach the cytosol and start recruiting alpha cyanoclein. So this part of, the, of my talk shows you that the, these aggregates target the membranes in our cell, the surface of the cells, but also the membranous compartments of our cell. And uh, it is through this, uh, the events they cause that they can lead to uh, synaptic dysfunction, neuronal stress, and eventual degeneration. But how is the aggregation of one protein causing distinct diseases? Usually, the aggregation of one protein was considered to cause one disease. And you may know that alpha synuclein aggregation is associated to Parkinson's disease, to dementia with Levy body, but also to multiple system atrophy. So how come one protein is causing very different diseases? So I made the hypothesis that, and I showed you earlier, that alpha synuclein is a dynamic protein. So it can populate many, many conformations. So I made the hypothesis that some of these conformations, not all, can assemble into different kinds of fibrils. So this conformation here, this form, that is represented by a cube, can pile up to form this kind of fibrils. And this other form that is represented by a cylinder can pile up to form another kind of fibril. One way to represent things uh, not with a drawing is to ask you to go back to Lego bricks. We all played with Lego bricks. You know that Lego bricks are made of exactly the same molecule, plastic. So let's replace plastic by alpha cyanoclein. Lego bricks have different form. So these are the different conformation or forms of alpha cyanoclein. And the form is very important because the form defines how you can pile up these bricks to form clumps, fibrils. So this is a, a way to represent things. Another way to represent thing is to use pasta. You know that pasta are made of exactly the same molecule. You have many, many forms of pasta. So the molecules are piled up in different ways. And the shape of pasta is very important because the, the shape defines how the pasta interact with, for example, tomato sauce or what your preferred sauce. Um, in other words, for example, self. So all this is theory. Let's go to reality. So in reality, fibrillar alpha synuclein uh, can assemble, and this is what we showed in my lab, into different fibrillar assemblies. Uh, it's exactly the same molecule that is assembling under different condition into thin fibrils, thicker fibrils, flat fibrils we call ribbons, twisted fibrils, and you can have different kinds of twists. What is important here is that these preparations are pure. Therefore, we can say, ask the question whether this form cause one disease, this other form cause another disease, and so on. So that's precisely what we did. So we first exposed neurons in culture to the different fibrils. And what we observed is differential binding to the different neurons. And we can quantify binding. 
So some fibrils bind very well to the neurons. Other kinds of fibrils barely bind, and you have all kinds of intermediates. We next injected these fibrils into the olfactory bulb of mice with Patrick Brundin. And we observed differential propagation within the brain and different level of pathology in the same model animal. So some fibrils spread very little, others spread much more. And not only they spread, they induce more or less pathology. Let's focus on two of these uh, fibrillar assemblies. So we injected these fibrillar assemblies in the brain of rats with Verley Bacalon. And what we observe is that uh, in both cases, we have the formation of Levy bodies and Levy neurites. But, and this is very important, it's only with this form here we call ribbons that we observed inclusion in oligodendrocytes. And this, as I told you from the beginning, is the signature of multiple system atrophy. We never see these aggregates when we inject fibrils uh, in the brain of the animals. And very interesting, uh, the fibrils are relatively resistant to proteolysis, while the ribbons are much less resistant. Three months after the injection of these fibrils, we observed that the endogenous alpha synuclein in the brain of these recipient animals was resistant to proteolysis when we injected fibrils, much less resistant to proteolysis when we injected ribbons. In other words, the exogenous fibrils are imprinting their properties to the endogenous alpha synuclein in the brain of animals. So there is templating. So to summarize what, I'm, what I just presented, we have one wild-type human alpha synuclein that we can assemble uh, into uh, two kinds of fibrils. I like to compare them again with to pasta because they have different shape. The, 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 the kind we call fibrils resemble spaghetti, while the kind we call ribbons, because they are flat, resemble linguine, another kind of pasta. When we injected these different fibrils in the brain, we, in both cases, we observed Levy body formation or Levy body-like structure formation. And it's only with the ribbons that we observed uh, cytoplasmic inclusion in oligodendrocyte. So this shows that the structure of the fibril defined the disease they cause in a model animal. So all this is sort of artificial and made in model animals. So we next ask the question, is this what we have in the brain of the patients? To answer the question, we established an amplification method in test tubes where we use aggregates from the brain of patients or from their gastrointestinal nervous system. And we use these homogenate because they contain seeds, aggregated alpha synuclein. We supplement these homogenate with monomeric alpha synuclein, and then we perform uh, successive cycles of elongation and fragmentation. And through these cycles, we amplify, we recruit more and more uh, monomeric alpha synuclein. At the end of the reaction, we get no fibrils with control patients, but we get fibrils with PD brain homogenate or a gastrointestinal nervous system homogenate and fibrils with MSA patient brain homogenate and so on. These fibrils look different in the electron microscope. They also have different limited proteolytic pattern. And I, as I told you earlier, uh, they differ in their resistance to proteolysis. When we injected these fibrils derived from patients' brains in uh, the brain of rodents, rats here with Verley Bacalon, we observed once again differential level of uh, pathology and differential spread within the brain of the recipient animals. Meaning that different aggregates uh, uh, amplified from patients, from different patients, induce different pathology in a model animal. 
as I showed you, alpha synuclein fibrils are propagating into the brain. This means that this process can be targeted uh, because it has a therapeutic potential. Reducing the propagation can slow down the disease. So what we aim in my lab is to modify the surfaces of the fibrils by binding you know, ligands to these, sur the, to these surfaces so that they change and the fibrils this way are no more able to bind to the, to the neuron. And what we are trying to produce are decoys to lure the fibrils and shield their uh, authentic receptors, for example, the sodium potassium ATPase. But to reach this objective, we need to uh, better understand the surfaces of these fibrils. So to reach this aim, we have been determining the structure of the, of the fibrils we produce by cryo-electron microscopy. So you see here fibrils, uh, that, which we solved the structure. Uh, so you can see from the, the wor this work that we carried out with Henning Stahlberg in, in Basel now, uh, uh, that the fibrils are made of two protofilaments, uh, sort of twisting around each other. Here you have a larger view. Each stack here, each molecule here of alpha synuclein is represented, and you could compare this to a stack of plates. Uh, and this work allows us to see what amino acids are exposed at the surface of the fibrils and what amino acids are hidden from the surface. Uh, what we are interested in are, uh, is the surface of the, uh, of the fibrils because we can target them with, let's say, antibodies, ligands, and so on. And what I represented here are two structures we solved with Henning Stahlberg. Uh, and what I am showing you here are these molecules that are stacked with amino acids that are labeled in blue or red. The I mean, red, uh, acidic amino acids are in red. The basic amino acids are in blue. Now, if you replace the blue and red uh, by large or thin bars, you end up with sort of, you know, barcode uh, that allows you to distinguish this, this different kinds of fibrils we generated in test tubes. More recently, we solved the structure of fibrils amplified from, derived from PD patients or MSA patients. And as you can see, the, the fold, the structure is different. Uh, meaning that the surfaces are different, the surfaces that are exposed to the solvent, to the protein in our cells are different. Uh, and I'm showing you here a, a zoom of this region here, where you can see again amino acids from different molecules of alpha synuclein piled up and uh, representing uh, uh, acidic or basic clumps or hydrophobic clumps at the surface of the fibrils. So the two form differ, for example, by their surfaces exposed to the solvent. So you can see here that this surface here is hidden from the solvent while it is exposed here to the solvent in the case of MSA-derived fibrils. So to summarize and finish, uh, what I showed you is that uh, alpha-synuclein fibrils all kinds of fibrils compromise neuronal cell membrane integrity uh, and the synaptic integrity. They are taken up, they are transported, they injure the endolysosomal compartment as well as the mitochondrial compartment. They reach the cytosol where they can recruit endogenous alpha synuclein and therefore multiply. The different form of the uh, pathogenic alpha synuclein uh, uh, can sort of be compared to strains because they cause different diseases uh, when injected into the brain. They exhibit differential tropism, and again, they uh, trigger different pathology in model animal. Uh, we amplified aggregates from patient's brain. We showed them to exhibit, again, different structures and different function. So targeting these aggregates uh, may allow us to treat MSA, uh, to treat Parkinson's disease, and or, or at least slow down disease progression. 
I would like to finish by thanking you for your attention, thanking my co-worker, my team, uh, thanking uh, our collaborators. Uh, I would like really to stress that uh, none of what I showed you would have been done without very active collaborations with many, many fantastic collaborators around the world, and thanking the funding agencies and the charities that are supporting our work. I would like to finish also by thanking you for your attention, and uh, I hope I get the opportunity to answer a question you may have. Thank you.